Well, good morning. This is a Veterans Breakfast Club uh, history and biography project, and we're delighted today to have as our guest uh, Tom Riley, who uh, served in the U.S. Army and is a veteran of both uh, Korea and Vietnam. So, Tom, welcome. We're delighted that you want to share your story. Well, thank you, Ben. Thank you very much for having me. You bet. And uh, so let's just start with how come you joined the Army? Well, um, I, I was lucky enough to get what was called the McNamara Fellowship at the time. If you remember, uh, Mr. McNamara was Secretary of Defense, and uh, the fellowship was, I mean, yeah, the McNamara Fellowship was what we called the draft. Well, I, uh, I, I got one of those pieces of paper, too. <laughs> I, I enlisted before I was drafted. Yeah, um, I did as well. I, I just didn't want to hang around and wait for them to decide. And also, I, I could have a, a choice of what, what to do rather than let them decide what to do. So that was the conditions under which I uh, I enlisted. Uh, went to Fort Dix for basic training and stayed there for another two months for advanced infantry training. And while there, I applied for OCS, Officer Candidate School, and... Uh, uh, was accepted and was sent to Fort Belvoir, which at that time was the engineer officer candidate school. Um, so after finishing um, infantry training, went to Belvoir in Virginia, spent uh, 26 weeks there going through the OCS. And uh, after completion of that, uh, I was surprised to get orders for Korea. Apparently, the circumstances at the time where they had pulled so many uh, field grade officers out of Korea to, to send to Vietnam, they didn't have enough officers for, uh, for all the billets in, uh, in units in Korea. Um, so I was sent, uh, and I, I actually, as a second lieutenant, I filled up a major slot as a detachment commander. Uh, who was a, acted as liaison and, and uh, uh, go-between advisor for a, a Rock Army Engineer Battalion. So I was learning as I was supposedly advising others what to do. So it was, it was very interesting. Um, I had a small detachment, about five enlisted men plus myself, and uh, we had a, uh, a battalion of of uh, uh, Korean engineers who numbered about 400 and uh, uh, plus another 250 Korean civilian workers uh, who did the pretty much the, the grunt work. We had the responsibility to maintain the roads and the bridges between the Seoul city limit and Pam and John. Uh, so that was, that was really it was an exciting time at the time because there was uh, there was a lot of shooting going on, uh, 67, 68. Uh, so that, that was interesting. But I, I thought I had the best job in the Army. I had my own little kingdom away from everybody else. Didn't really have to answer too much to anybody. and uh, Went where I wanted to, when I wanted to, and uh, assigned papers as they were put in front of me, and uh, it, it was it was a good deal. Uh, as I was coming, as that tour was coming to a close, uh, I didn't feel like going back to the states and just doing training, so I volunteered. I was single, so I volunteered for Vietnam and uh, got orders for that. So in June of '68, uh, I went to Vietnam. They uh, arrived in Saigon. They couldn't figure out what to do with me, so they sent me to uh, Cameron. Uh, they finally decided something to do with me and sent me to this unit that was up in the Central Highlands, um, 299th Engineer Battalion Combat. Uh, there we. Uh, uh, I was originally a platoon leader for a light equipment company. And uh, uh, when the XO 
I was a first lieutenant by that time, so I was kind of senior in comparison to the others, other junior officers. Um, so as uh, people rotated, we we rotated home. Uh, we moved along, and I became uh, from platoon leader, went to uh, Company XO, and uh, from there, Battalion S4. We, uh, we were supporting the uh, 4th Inf Infantry Division in uh, that AO, which was the Northern I Corps, uh, Central Highlands Tri Border Area. Uh, our particular area was between Pleiku and uh, Ducto, uh, which was about 100 miles, maybe less. Uh, there we were maintaining roads and replacing bridges with culverts so that Charlie couldn't just keep blowing them up. Uh, we built uh, several schools, a couple of hospitals. Uh, uh, cleared areas on mountaintops for fire bases. Um, supported the, uh, the armor and the artillery where they needed engineer support. Uh, what else can I tell you? Well, uh, any particular highlights of your time in Vietnam or uh, that you'd like to share with us? Uh, there were a number of them. Uh, most of which would take too long to talk about. I suppose the, the highlight would be the uh, uh, towards the end. Well, we had kind of a, an interesting working relationship with the local VC. We knew who they were. They knew who we were, obviously. Uh, when they, they were laying, laying down uh, mines in the roads, uh, they did a sloppy job to make sure that nobody got hurt so that we saw where the mines were and we could remove them. And that's that was one of our things. Uh, every morning we had to clear something like about uh, 10 or 15 miles of road, which meant walking the road with mine detectors and, and uh, uh, digging up mines and removing them or destroying them in place. Uh, so the local VC would do a sloppy job of, in many, most cases, would do a sloppy job in, in uh, covering the mines, and we could see where it was dug up. So we were able to, we, we didn't get too many people hurt, or too many vehicles uh, blown up, as long as it was the local VC. Uh, then when those times, over the course of the year that I was there, uh, there were several times when the North Vietnamese came in, and they decided they were going to do things their way. And uh, they were a lot more professional uh, in terms of tricky mines that they, uh, booby traps that they, they put out uh, and in terms of uh, uh, ambushes that they set out for us along the road, both for, for ourselves, so the minesweep teams, as well as the convoys that were constantly supplying us in the infantry and the artillery. So that, that, it was different times, it was different conditions. I mean, there were times when I could ride the roads and didn't even carry an M16 with me. There were other times when I wasn't going on those roads without some sort of escort. Uh, just the way the conditions changed from week to week, month to month. Uh, and towards the end, um, we, uh, we were surrounded by, we were about 450 population of uh, engineers. And let me go back a little bit. And um, when Nixon was inaugurated, he started this uh, policy of Vietnamization where he was going to turn the war over to the Vietnamese and let them manage it and fight it the way they wanted. Uh, which is all fine and dandy, except the Vietnamese military wasn't really going along with that. They were kind of happy where they were. Uh, the encampments that they had. Uh, in our in our case, there was an old French uh, military establishment. Uh, 
that went back to the days of Kim Bim Phu in the 50s. And the, the, Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese, the Arvins, had uh, occupied that for years. And they were very happy there. They had their families down in the village of Tien Kien, about a half a mile away, easy walk. Uh, uh, they were very comfortable. And then when the Americans said, uh, no, you're going to have to go down the hill about two miles to the airstrip and take it over and defend it. Uh, airstrip and, and fire base. Uh, they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to leave where they were. Uh, the, the 4th Infantry Division was pulled out. So there was no infantry. <laughs> so somebody came up with a bright idea. Um, let's use these engineers that we get up there that nobody knows about. Let's have them take over the fire base and the airstrip and let them defend it. So we had to pack up and move like practically overnight um, and set up a, a, our own base um, down around Sear Strip at Dacto um, because we had a much smaller population than what the infantry had. We couldn't defend anywhere near the, the area that they were able to. We just didn't have the, the people to do it. Uh, so we came up with some ingenious ideas, like uh, we'd defend half the airstrip at night. I'm sorry. We would defend half the airstrip all the time, and the other half only during the day. At night, we would put concertina wire across the airstrip, and, and uh, uh, that, that it would belong to Charlie at night. Um, so that was kind of interesting. And at some point, the NVA uh, realized what had happened and that there was just a, a small contingent of people, of us, uh, who were left there. Now, when they say Pecto, we also had this other base about eight miles away called Ben Hat, Special Forces Base, that we were also supporting. Uh, so we had fewer than, we had about 450 between the two bases in this area. Um, so the North Vietnamese decided that they, they were going to take this over. And they sent uh, an estimated 5,000 regulars and surrounded us. Uh, and that kind of, when I heard the intelligence report, that, that turned my blood absolutely cold. Because uh, I knew we were in deep trouble. We all knew we were in deep trouble. Uh, so they started hitting us on a regular basis with rockets every day at lunchtime and every night at dinner time. We were stupid enough to keep keep having our meals at the same time every day as if it was peacetime. And the NVA picked up on that. And that's when they were, they were going to try to get us when we were grouped together. Um, so they would hit us at, at lunch, they would hit us at dinner, and hit us sometime during the night, just so we, we couldn't get a, a full night's sleep. Um, so that went on for 56 days. We had 44% casualties during that period of time. Um, it, it, was, it was really interesting, to say the least. Uh, uh, that would get your attention, yes. Uh, my tour was up about three weeks into the siege, and uh, I managed to uh, hop on a convoy that managed to get through and was going south. Uh, so I managed to get out during this, this period of time, lucky enough. Um, and that was in 69? 69, June of 69. So I came back uh, to Fort Lewis in Washington, was discharged. Flew home. Um, uh, I was going back to school, Boston College, and uh, thought I was through with the military. Then on December 7th of all days, I got a letter saying I was being reactivated. We called up and said, you can't do that. Yeah, we, we own you for six years. Oh, okay. 
but that worked out okay. As uh, you know, just a weekend warrior, uh, I was going to school, going to school. So this is a pretty good uh, part-time job. No heavy lifting. Just go to the Boston Army base and do whatever had to be done as far as training goes. Uh, on one Saturday and Sunday a month, and a couple weeks in the summer would go to Camp Trum in New York and uh, uh, play there. Overall, I had a pretty, I had a much better time than a lot of people. What else can I tell you? Well, it was an Army Reserve unit in Boston where you were. Yeah. Yeah. And you did that for four years then? Two, or? Two, years. No, two years. Two years. Yeah. Okay. Good. And uh, it was interesting when Fort Drum, in fact, that photo behind me is a C 130. Uh, landing on dirt strip at Fort Drum. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I never yeah. went in there summertime. I only went in there in the wintertime, which was always dicey. <laughs> but that's another yeah. story. At any yeah. rate, so uh, you continued on and got your degree? Yes. Okay. And uh, did you stay in Boston or? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, took a job at the engineering construction, architect engineer construction company. Okay. Uh, building nuclear power plants, which were big in those days. Yes. Uh, and uh, I, I did move with them. I moved to uh, upstate New York, not too far from Camp Drum or Fort Drum. Uh, then moved to uh, Long Island, two different construction sites. Uh, spent the uh, better part of 10 years doing that. Uh, Came back to Boston, worked in the home office for a while. So was your engineer training then in the Army was directly applicable with what you did after you finished college? To some degree, uh, with my professional career with the, the, uh, the, the engineering company, at least I was able to understand uh, some of the, the some of the influences that, that go into construction and engineering and had some exposure to it to a much smaller degree while in the army, much smaller scope. Mm -hmm. So how'd you find the, the difference in working with military people in, in the army and then being with a civilian construction uh, company? I think the uh, okay. You you making me you're making me pause. I got to think about that. Um, I think the, the the civilians were more focused on getting the job done and getting a job done well, as opposed to those in the military who were there for. Like in in um, we were there for 365 days. People were interested in finishing the 365 days and and going home. Right. It was a different incentive. Oh, very definitely. Yeah, neither Vietnam or 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 Korea, I would imagine, would have been a, a different viewpoint. Anything else uh, that you'd like to share with us as a a veteran? Have you continued to do anything with uh, as a veteran uh, with veteran organizations since you left the army? Or uh... yeah, I'm active in uh, the VFW. I'm a lifetime member. Uh, I was active in the Vietnam Veterans of America in uh, uh, in Beaver outside of Pittsburgh. It's a very very active chapter with. I don't know, something like 850 members. Uh, and they're very active in the community, which I enjoyed. Right. Um, they're like the third biggest in, in the country. Uh, the VFW chapter I'm involved in here in Rhode Island only has about 100, some odd, 120 members. Even though still very active, there just aren't as many people. There isn't the same electricity. Sure. Not as many people get involved. Okay. Well, Tom, anything else that you would like to, to share with us? 
Not that I can think of. Okay. Well, Tom, thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of the Veterans Breakfast Club, uh, with being willing to uh, uh, to share your story and uh, taking your time to do that, so I uh, hope you'll have a uh, uh, a very good rest of the day, and uh, look forward to seeing you soon on some more uh, uh, Vietnam uh, Breakfast Club uh, programs. So that'll be great. I look great. forward to that too. Thank you very much, Ben. Okay, you bet.